Good morning, kids. In the event that you're watching this recording, it will mean that I'm unable to meet you online because of some connectivity issues. I'm currently Zooming with you from a remote location in Thailand. So I will be recording this video as a backup in the event that I'm not able to meet you online on Zoom. And I hope that you'll be able to view this recording and then incorporate it into your own writing activities as a continuation of the earlier session that we've had back in May where I went through some language enhancement strategies with you in Composition Language Enhancement Part 1. Please refer to that video if you have forgotten some of the strategies that I shared with you then. Today, I will be talking about dialogue, characters, and monologues. Again, I'll be talking about dialogue, characters, and monologues. How do we use these three powerful tools to build a much more interesting and engaging composition for your readers. Before we go into these three strategies, I want to remind us that the previous video that I did covered two very powerful strategies on using commas and connectors in order to build detail in your writing, as well as verbs used in tandem with one another, strung up into groups of twos and threes to build a combination of a powerful action-packed sentence. I will be using some of these strategies together with the three new strategies to build some powerful, engaging, and interesting pieces of writing today. So come along with me as I cover these three simple yet powerful tools. Beginning with effective dialogue. Now, as you know, the word dialogue means a conversation between two people or two characters. And in a story, we must be careful not to use too much dialogue because we are writing a narrative, not a conversation. So be very, very sparing and strategic in your use of dialogue in your writing. That being said, what are some of the important rules that govern effective use of dialogue in our writing? Now, the first rule or technique is to know your punctuation. When you use dialogue, always remember to watch out for these main ingredients. Number one, after your saying verb, in the case of this sentence, she yelled, don't you dare open that box. The saying verb is yelled. There's always a comma after the saying verb, followed by an open inverted comma, right? The two little open inverted commas on the top and a capital letter. Always remember that even though the dialogue appears in the middle of a sentence, it always opens with a capital letter, don't. Notice that the D for don't is capitalized and it always ends with a punctuation mark. In this case, don't you dare open that box, exclamation mark is the ending punctuation. It is always inside the close inverted commas, never outside of it. Next, if the dialogue is in the front of the sentence, then likewise, don't you dare open that box, don't is still capitalized. It comes after the open inverted commas. And there is still a punctuation that ends that sentence, exclamation mark. Don't you dare open that box, exclamation, followed by a close inverted comma. Now, what is different here is that the word that comes after the close inverted comma is always in the lower case. Notice she yelled, she is in lowercase s. However, be careful if you're using the names of people like Tristan or John or Adam, then those proper nouns should still be capitalized. So that's technique one, know your punctuation. Technique two, avoid repeating the same saying verb. Do not use said, said, replied, replied, shouted, shouted. These are level one basic verbs and if you repeat them again and again, what's going to happen is that it will make your dialogue and by extension, your composition, extremely boring and mundane sounding. It sounds very basic. So vary your saying verbs using these three different methods. One, substitute the saying verb with another one. Instead of saying shouted, say yell. Instead of saying yell, say screamed. Two, use adjectives to describe the manner in which that sentence is being said. Right? She shouted, veins popping up on her neck. 
as she screamed at the top of her lungs. Okay, these are adjective phrases that describe the manner in which that particular sentence is being said or the appearance of the character as he or she is saying it. And finally, have an accompanying action while your character is making that statement or asking that question, he or she may have an action that accompanies that sentence, right? So I'll give you an example of this three different methods in action. So here is an example of a basic dialogue between two characters, Jonah and Sove. Take a look, read it. Now look at the rewritten, more effective dialogue version of the same exchange between Jonah and Sylvie. Notice how asked has been changed into whispered accusingly. I've substituted asked for whispered to show the manner in which Jonah asked that question. And I've added in an adverb accusingly, showing you the manner in which he whispered. So I'm adding a higher order verb and I'm describing that verb with an adverb. Next, instead of simply replying, Sove rose from his seat and slammed his fist on the table, again showing us his anger and how upset he is about what Jonah has just accused him of. I didn't do anything. Finally, Jonah's reply, instead of shouting, we find that Jonah blasted, again a substitution, shouted becomes blasted, and with an accompanying action, he pointed angrily at Sove. So notice how substitution, adjectives and adverbs, as well as accompanying actions can really make your dialogue so much more effective. And this is similar to how we built action-packed sentences, isn't it? When we used a sequence of verbs strung together to make a sentence much more exciting to read. Likewise, in this case, dialogues can also be built up to be more detailed, more exciting, and more engaging using the methods I mentioned of substituting, adding adjectives and adverbs, as well as having an accompanying action to the statement or the question that the character is saying or asking. So this, in a nutshell, is the technique of effective dialogue. Knowing your punctuation, substituting, adding, and accompanying your saying verbs, right? So here is an extract. You may pause the video to read it. This is not a good example of dialogue used in composition writing. Notice how there are too many exchanges between your characters and how with a lot of dialogue, you break up the flow of your narrative and your story becomes disjointed. It doesn't flow anymore because there's too much talking. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce the number of dialogue exchanges between my characters. I'm going to add, substitute the saying verbs, add adjectives and adverbs. And finally, I'm going to bring in some accompanying actions that will make this much more exciting and interesting to read. Now, take a look at this much more summarized and yet more impactful version of that same dialogue. You may pause your screen here to read. Notice how all three methods are in action, of course, along with the correct use of punctuation. All right. So I hope you can see from these two examples and comparisons how much more powerful your writing can get if you get your dialogue right. Don't overuse it, but add to the saying verbs. Substitute a higher order verb. Add in adjectives and adverbs. And finally, of course, accompany your saying verbs with actions. All right, next, I'm going to cover how we can build powerful characters. And I'm gonna cover names, ands and buts, as well as actions that can be tagged to your characters to make them much more interesting and much more engaging. So powerful, memorable characters are never straightforward. 
right? You never have a simple character and expect that character to be interesting to your readers. You must always describe your character, give your character a personality, make your character go through a difficult situation so that your readers can feel sympathy or empathy with your characters. So how do I do this? Through giving your characters a voice. Let them say and do things that would either attract or repulse your readers. His mannerisms or her mannerisms, how your character acts, how your character conducts himself or herself. And finally, his or her reactions, his, his or her feelings, and how he, he or she acts on those feelings. These things give your readers an insight into your characters and make your characters much more three-dimensional and interesting. So these are the three techniques I would recommend for building a powerful character. First of all, most simply, but may sometimes be more difficult, give your character an interesting or uncommon name that is memorable. Especially if your character is the hero of the story or the villain of the story, give your character something uncommon or interesting. Avoid common names like Jane and John, which are not memorable and tend to fade from the memory of your readers. Two, use and and but to create more detail about your character. For example, Harry was a strong but cowardly lion. So you contrast using the connector but. Or you could enhance using the connector and. Harry was a strong and courageous lion. All right, so technique three, give your characters actions and reactions. Don't tell your reader how your character's feeling, show your reader. Actions speak louder than words. And of course, this is tied to what we've learned in lower primary, show, not tell. So technique one, give your character an interesting name. Technique two, add to your character's description using ands and buts. Technique three, give your character interesting actions that illustrate his or her inner feelings, actions, and reactions. So I'm not going to go through this practice with you in this video, but I would like you to practice using this. All right. Now, in order to add to the complexity and the engagement of your characters, you may want to use a technique called illustrating internal emotions and showing subtle actions. What do they mean? I'm going to go into detail. Now, emotions are when a character is feeling something and that feeling leads to certain actions and mannerisms that show your reader how they feel without you saying it. Try thinking of a person who is very nervous. Imagine that person in front of you. What are the mannerisms, actions, reactions, facial expressions that would give his nervousness away. Right, now take a look at this. Morgan was nervous. Now this is something that we want to avoid. We don't want to tell the reader that Morgan was nervous. We want to give the reader many details that allow my reader or your reader to infer that Morgan is nervous. So look at the second example. Morgan twiddled his thumbs as he rocked his plastic chair back and forth. He would glance nervously or sharply in the direction of any sound that echoed down that dimly lit corridor. That tight knot he felt in his throat was suffocating. Notice how his actions, twiddling his thumbs, rocking his plastic chair, his facial expressions, nervously glancing at the direction of any sound, and his internal emotions, the tight knot he felt in his throat, are all contributing towards describing Morgan's nervousness. All right, now let's go into the last strategy that I would like to share with you today called a monologue. Now, in addition to a character displaying his or her emotions through the subtle actions and mannerisms, a character can sometimes engage in what is called a monologue. Now, what's a monologue? A monologue is a conversation that the character has with him or herself. 
It's an internal conversation. And it does not require punctuation like dialogue. Because remember, dialogue is when you say something out loud to someone else. And that's a saying. It's an action of saying something. So a saying verb and the punctuation related to dialogue is required to show when a character is speaking to another one. But in a monologue, remember monologue, one person speaking to oneself, no punctuation for dialogue is required. You can simply write out what your character is saying to him or herself as a single sentence and string these sentences together. I would qualify that by saying you should not have more than two or three sentences of monologue for your character. For example, in the case where a character has negative feelings or is engaged in internal conflict, perhaps a temptation, perhaps the character is debating with himself or herself whether he or she should take something from an unattended shop. That sense of internal conflict could be very effectively displayed through a monologue. Should I? Should I take it? There's no one watching, right? That could be a two, three sentence string that shows you the kind of internal dialogue and the kind of internal struggle that the character is having. No, I shouldn't. Mother would never approve, right? So I can add these sentences in. Should I take it? No, I shouldn't. But it's so beautiful. Sentences like these can be powerful tools to show like a snapshot what's going on inside the mind and the heart of your character. So you can use monologues in order to add to the interest and the engagement of the reader's experience of your right of your character struggles. All right? I hope that these strategies have been useful and helpful to you today. Now in our next session, I will be going through a revision of our planning process, right? I will go through again how we can put all of these language enhancements and content enhancement strategies together in our planning and in our writing. I will talk about how big ideas will influence your structure and how your structure will allow you then to fill in the bones of your writing with many things that make it more interesting using all of these various enhancement strategies. So I hope that today's session has been useful to you. I remind you to finish writing your practice compositions on SLS and submit them to me using as many of these strategies as you can. And do remember to review the videos that I posted earlier so that you can put all these strategies together to make your writing much more effective. So next session on Saturday, we are going to go through a quick revision of all the various language enhancement strategies. And we will do a little exercise to put them all together so that you can see how I would put these strategies together in an actual piece of writing. All right. I hope that this has been useful and that you have understood what I've shared. If not, please feel free to send me a message and uh, review this video. You can watch it multiple times. And I hope this is helpful and I hope to be able to see you on Zoom. Right. Thank you very much. And I'll see all of you again very soon in school when school reopens. Have a wonderful rest of the June holidays. Bye.